Uh, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up and as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you together with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we come before your word this morning, you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit. He who indwells and empowers all who believe, may he speak to our hearts this day and convict us where we are wrong and where we're, uh, we're in sin and encourage us, Lord, to, to live as we should in a manner worthy of the calling by which we've been called. We pray you grant us understanding and insight today that coming to a deeper knowledge of you and of your son and of what he's done for us and the empowering of your spirit that we might be transformed practically day by day that we might bring glory to you amen okay now to, today we are looking at the end of chapter four and it is a difficult passage it is, I believe, the hardest passage in the book of Ephesians to teach. It is uh, perhaps the most misunderstood passage in the book of Ephesians. It is important for us to understand it correctly, that we understand what Paul is saying in the context of chapter 4. Um, and so I'll need to refer back to last week's sermon somewhat for those who weren't here. Um, but also to understand what he's saying in the context of the Old Testament. So while it might be a bit challenging this morning, it's also a very good illustration, I think, of how we go about studying our Bibles. So let's give it a go. Um, this is the anger passage. It has anger mentioned here multiple times. Um, we are told in verse 26, be angry and do not sin. If you have an NIV and certain other translations at this point, you may have the word if there, if you are angry. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But other versions will simply say be angry. And then it talks about not letting the sun go down on your anger. And at the end, we're told to let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be, away, be put away from you. Um, and so it, the passage deals with this whole concept of anger in multiple ways and times. And it can be difficult and it can be tricky. So let's get our, let's get our bearings and let's get our context. We're talking in chapter 4 about the Christian life. Walking in a manner that is worthy of the calling by which we've been called. And having talked about how that happens practically in a corporate setting, there's more specifics that we dealt with last time. Particularly last time, we were told not to walk in a way that the Gentiles do. So someone who is not religious, who doesn't have any background in faith, for them morals may be a very loose thing. And that is not the way that those of us who have been called by God, those of us who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, and those of us who have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, it's not the way that we should be walking. Now, the key thing last time, as I emphasized, the key thing last time was the repetition of the concept of the mind and of knowledge and of understanding. So when he goes through this section, he talks about not walking as they do. How do they walk? They walk in the futility of their minds. So the way that they are thinking is futile. It, it accomplishes nothing of value. 
That's the thing that distinguishes them. And when we think about how the non-religious person might live, we're thinking about the bad behaviour. But what Paul is doing is he's addressing the way of thinking that then leads to the bad behaviour. He's dealing with the mind. And so he talks about futility of the minds. They are darkened in their understanding. Another word there related. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. And so they have this darkness in their understanding which alienates them from God and they're alienated from God so they can't think correctly and you have this cycle that's hard to break. And the key to it is, is that this whole cycle happens because of the hardness of their hearts. It is a hard heart that leads to not believing in God, not believing that what God says is true is true. And it's a hard heart that rejects the authority of God, which creates this cycle of bad understanding and bad behavior and alienating yourself from God. That's how the ungodly live and we are not to live that way. They have, and then as a result, become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, um, greedy, uh, to practice every kind of impurity. And so the bad behavior comes from the way of thinking. It's not that they think the wrong way. They, they, the, um, they think that they, they just behave badly and don't behave that way. The whole thinking leads to that. And it ultimately comes from the hardness of their hearts. But here's the key bit. But that is not the way that you learned Christ. And again, learning, understanding, knowledge, same concept. When we came to Christ, it was with a soft heart. We had to, in coming to Christ, accept that we were sinners. We, in coming to Christ, had to accept that God's way, the way of Christ, the way of redemption through him, that that was the right way. We had to soften our hearts and bow before the authority of God. And that was the way in which that cycle of thinking was broken in our lives. We learned, we gained understanding through being softened. So, to go back to that way is turning on the head the, the very entrance that we had to our Christian lives. So having come to God by submitting to his authority, by softening our hearts and learning and believing what he said to be true, we then, if we go back to the old way of thinking, we do an injustice to our walk. We do an injustice to our calling. And so that's not how we learn Christ, assuming you've heard about him, we're taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, the key word here is truth. We'll come back to this in a minute for our new passage today. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, is corrupt through deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on your new self. And so we ended last time with those three commands, those three things that we have to do. Because we've received Christ and we were taught in him and the truth is in Jesus and here's that truth. We've got to put off our old self. We have desires that are deceitful and we're going to put that away. We're going to now submit to God instead. We are going to be renewed in the spirit of our minds, in our spiritual minds. It's that changing of the way of thinking. So we're putting away the old life, we're having our mind changed and the way of thinking changed, and then we can put on the new self created after the likeness of God, true righteousness and holiness. So that's really last week. And it's very important we understand that because it is the basis for this week. So I couldn't not repeat all of that. Okay? The thing that he's saying last time 17 through 24 is that there is a way of thinking which alienates oneself from God that is due to our hardness of heart it is a wrong way of thinking but when we became Christians we submitted to the authority of God we learned from God we learned what God said in the gospel and we submitted to that and that is the way we need to continue because and here's the key thing the truth is in Jesus right now, if, and it's certainly possible, or the passage wouldn't be here, if having submitted to God, having softened our hearts, having put aside our deceitful desires to rule our own world, to be in charge, to make our own decisions, we come as a sinner before God and we say, Christ, 
I can do nothing. I am a sinner before God. May I be forgiven on the basis of your blood. If we come to him and trust in his sacrificial death on the cross and we submit ourselves, if we then go back to doing whatever we darn well please, living how we want to live, following our deceitful desires, if we go back to living that way, that is a false representation of Christianity. Christianity is about breaking that cycle of thinking. It is about breaking that cycle of thinking that way. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to live like I want to live. Breaking that and saying, God, what do you want me to do? Renew my mind. Teach me how it is I should be, how I should think, how I should live, how I should act. And if we go on doing what we want to do, do, if we go on, we will end up living a life that is alienated from God. And that is not an accurate representation of the Christian life. The truth is in Jesus. Now, verse 25, keep that all fresh in your mind. Therefore, we've got the therefore there, so it links to the previous section. Are you right? Yes? Okay. Therefore, on the basis of what has just been said, and the previous section was a slightly different thing, so I'm looking here at this point of verses 17 and on. Therefore, having put away falsehood. Now, at what point in verses 17 through 24 did it address us lying? Speaking lies, telling lies. It didn't. I mean, you could argue that lying is a form of impurity, and it said every kind of impurity. But it really wasn't addressing lying. In fact, the only time that the truth lie concept was mentioned in the previous section was saying that the truth was in Jesus. Saying that the right way of thinking, which leads to the right behavior, is in Christ. So what he's saying is, We've put something aside, right? That's what he's saying. You've put aside falsehood, right? What have we put aside according to the previous section? We've put aside a way of thinking that leads to immoral behavior. We've put aside a way of thinking that leads to bad practice. We've put aside a way of thinking that leads us to misrepresent the Christian faith by walking a walk that has more in common with the world than it does with godliness. So the falsehood that we've put aside, and this is where this passage is so terribly misunderstood, and if you can't get verse 25 right, you're going to be lost in verse 26. It's not talking about putting aside the act of lying, telling lies, though you should put that aside. <laughs> what it's saying is, is you've put aside the false representation of Christianity, a false way of living, a way of living that says, I will do what I want to do and I am my own boss and I will do what I want. And that will always, because of our deceitful desires, because of our sinful nature that we should have put off, that will always lead us to ungodliness. And the reality is, is that there are Christians. And there are Christian churches. <sighs> no, I won't name them today. But there are entire movements of churches that seem to be dedicated to being worldly. Like it's the thing to do. Let's be worldly. Let's just be like the world and have no difference. So, so if there are sins that the world likes but the church doesn't, well, we don't want to ostracize ourselves from all those potential uh, donators, I mean Christians. So let's make sure that we don't ostracize them and let's be a little bit in, uh, indecisive over those sins. And the reality is, is that's exactly what this passage is addressing. There is, there is godliness and holiness, righteousness and holiness that God has called us to walk in and there is the old way of living and you have put aside that falsehood and are living the right way. That's the falsehood. That's the falsehood that you've put aside. Therefore, having put away falsehood, 
Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbour. Okay, follow the train of thought here. If the falsehood is the wrong way of living, and that's the picture that Paul's painting, he says, when he then says, speak the truth to your neighbour, what he's saying in context is this. He's saying to the person who is in the world, don't be like them to reach them, but be an accurate representation of the redeeming power of Christ's blood to them. That's the way to be relevant to them. Not to be like them. Because what we're trying to do is present Christ to them so that they can put off the old man. And if you're living like one who has never put off the old man, then you have nothing to offer them. Hey, let me tell you about a new way of living. Let me tell you how you can overcome sin. Let me tell you how you can be redeemed from sin. You can't say that if you're living in sin. So it is, it is a declaration here that we would speak truthfully to our neighbours by the way in which we live our lives so that we are accurately representing Christ and his saving work in the way that we conduct ourselves amongst the world. That's what verse 25 means. Isn't context a powerful thing? I mean, most times you'll come to this verse and people are preaching stuff about not telling lies. It's not what it's talking about at all. And if you need backup from that, then you may notice some of you in your Bibles, you may have bold or italicized, that this Paul here is actually quoting from Zechariah chapter 8. And as we should always do when we come across a quotation from the Old Testament, we should turn there and look at it in context. So let's turn to Zechariah and chapter 8. Your best bet is to go back to Matthew and then just very slowly go backwards from there. Because you've only got Malachi and then Zechariah before Matthew. We won't spend too long here because there's lots more to do today. But uh, in Zechariah, we're going to chapter 8. And as you're turning there, I'll just keep talking. In chapter 7, we have a passage um, where the people of Israel, the leaders come... Um, they, they come before uh, the high priest and they come and ask, the, ask of the Lord. And they're basically saying, do we keep on fasting? We're fasting on this day and we're fasting on that day. And do we keep on fasting? Um, I haven't preached too many times where people have stormed out in a sermon. But I had someone storm out of this sermon when I preached on Zechariah 7 once. Which uh, was, I think, a, a, a compliment in one sense because I obviously hit the nail on the head. But basically, it's a passage that speaks straight to the heart of religion. It's a passage, chapter 7, this is, where it talks about how look, we're fasting on this day, we're fasting on that day, and, and what have you. And the gist of it is, is that God says, I never told you to do that. Here you are doing these religious deeds for me. I never told you to do that. Why are you doing that? What you need to do is not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, the poor. Don't devise evil against one another in your heart. In other words, don't do some religious act and think that that makes you okay with me while you're living ungodly lives. That's what he's saying. That's context in chapter 7. In chapter 8, he says, but, and then he ends chapter 7, actually, I should say, by saying, you know, this is the basis for great anger, uh, verse uh, 12, end of verse 12, uh, and I called, they would not hear, I called, and they would not hear. Uh, I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations that they had not known. And thus the land they left was desolate, so that no one went to and fro, and the pleasant land was made desolate. And so, at the time of Zechariah, with the rebuilding of the temple following that time, the word of the Lord comes in chapter 8, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I am jealous for her with a great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion, I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. And so he then begins to talk about a time of renewal, a time of renewal for Israel. 
And uh, skip through to verse 14. For thus says the Lord of hosts, as I purpose to bring disaster to you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, and I did not relent, says the Lord of hosts, so again I have purposed in these days to bring good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, fear not. So, that's why chapter 7 context was important. There they were trying to do religious deeds. He says, no, I don't want your religious deeds, I want godliness. And it didn't happen, and that's why you were punished. But, in the way that I decided I was going to punish you, and I did, there is a time when I will decide to bless you, and I will. In the same way I made the decision to punish you, I made the decision to bless you. And this is, so therefore fear not... But these are the things that you should do. And and notice just in passing here, when we're looking at a prophecy in Zechariah, he's talking about a future time, how different that is from Old Testament typically. I'm going to bless you, now live this way. The whole of the Old Testament is, live this way and I'll bless you. This is pointing to the new covenant. He says, verse 16, and this is the verse where Paul quotes, These are the things that you should do. Speak the truth to one another, Render in your gates judgment that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another and love no false oath for all these things I hate, declares the Lord. So with the repetition of devising evil, don't devise evil. Previously in chapter 7 you devise evil. He's contrasting chapter 7 and 8. Okay, And what he's saying here is this. You need to speak to the truth to one another rendering judgments that are true. So in the context of Zechariah 8, speaking the truth is is issuing a true judgment. And the true judgment is the putting aside of the religious acts that God has not asked for and doing the things that he has asked for and the, the main things such as mercy and justice and holiness and these kinds of things. And that's what he's saying should be done. Um, and no devising of evil. So what, again, just so we've got the context here, what Zechariah is dealing with here, when he says, speak the truth to one another, he's saying in context, make a judgment that are truthful, that are righteous. Make judgments of righteous living as opposed to a religiosity that says, look how godly I am. I fast on this day and I fast on that day. But inside you're devising evil. That's a false thing. That is a lie. It is a lie to say I'm a religious person because I do this and I read my Bible every day and I fast on this day and I do this and I do that. Look how religious I am when inwardly you're plotting evil. When inwardly you're, you're unrighteous and you don't care about those who are in need, you're happy to trample over them to show everybody how righteous you are. Okay? That's a lie. So when he in chapter 8 says, speak the truth to your neighbor, he's talking the neighbor there is the context of the community and giving good judgment. Give good judgments. I'm going to treat that poor person well. I'm going to look after that widow. I'm going to be godly in this situation. I'm not going to present religiosity and have evil in my heart. So in Zechariah 8, that supports what I'm saying here. Go back to Ephesians 4 now. That supports what I'm saying in Ephesians 4. In that Paul, in quoting Zechariah 8, is taking an Old Testament concept where truth is not merely the speaking of what is true. It is the living in a way that is an accurate and honest representation rather than a religious lie. It's to do with how we live. It's to do with how we treat one another in community. And that's why Paul quotes it there. So, let's get our context again, because it's going to get even more tricky in a minute. The context is this. We put aside a way of living that the unbelievers do. That will be a false representation. And we are going to speak truth to our neighbor in the sense that we are going to present God accurately and truthfully. We aren't going to cover up unrighteousness with religiosity. We're going to have righteousness. 
And we're going to have that, as we saw in the previous section, by putting off the old man, the old self, which, but, which is corrupted through deceitful desires. We're going to have our minds renewed in the word, and we are going to put on the new self, empowered by the Spirit of God, to live in the way that the Bible commands us to live. And it is that living that truly represents the calling of God and gives hope to the lost. If we, if we, if we allow or embrace people's sin, if we share in their sin, we have no hope for the lost at all. We are in an era where people celebrate their sins. All sorts of different sins. The way in which you deal with conviction of sin is by making it a positive thing. And let's celebrate in it. Guys, we can't do that. Because that person who seems to be celebrating is a broken person whose sin is destroying them. And we are offering hope to them that they can be free from their sin. And that's why we mustn't falsely represent with our lives or with the embracing of sin as we shall see. And that is the context for this strange and peculiar verse here. Be angry and do not sin. Now, if you have an NIV, and I think there are a couple of other versions to do it as well, you may well have the word if here. If you are angry, do not sin. So if you so happen to be angry one day, then don't sin. Okay, so somebody comes along and says, you're a stinking loser, and you get angry with them for calling you a stinking loser, probably because you know you're a stinking loser, you don't like being told that, and you want to knock their block off, you don't knock their block off if you're angry with them, because that will be sin. Now, that does seem in some translations what the verse could mean in context, but that is totally alien to the context that we're looking at here. Okay. Firstly, we need to know this. There is no if in the Greek. There is literally here two commands. Very clear. In the original, there are two commands. Command number one, be angry. Command number two, do not sin. There are your two commands. Now, that's a little bit confusing. You can see why people struggle with it. You can see why people want to get rid of it. They, want to, they struggle with it because at the end of the chapter it says, put aside all anger. Let, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. So how can you put away anger at the end of the chapter if at the beginning of this section you're told to be angry? That's a little bit confusing. So you can see why people struggle with it. Now, People will argue, and some scholars will argue, that there are some occasions in Greek where a, a sequence of commands like this, and I won't bore you with all the technical terminology, but basically you have two commands, and the first command can be essentially mean if. Now the example that is given of this, and it, and it is true, and it is a good example, is in John chapter 1. We won't bother turning there, but there is a phrase that is repeated in John chapter 1, where Jesus says to the first disciples, Come, command, and see, command. Come and see. And then later when Nathaniel comes along and the, the first disciples become the first evangelists, they say to Nathaniel, Come and see. And the, if you accept that you know, the first of the two commands can become, um, can become a, a conditional, is the phrase, then it would be, if you come, you will see. If you come, you will see. And that's how many versions translate it. And that is accurate and a good way of doing it. Because what Jesus is saying when he says two commands, come, see. What he's saying by the implication of those two commands is if you come to me, then you'll see what I'm talking about. Right? Okay? Well, if that's what's going on in Ephesians, let's see what that says. If you are angry, you will not sin. <laughs> is that what the passage is saying? It's saying, if you're angry, you know your problem here, your problem is that you're not angry. And that's sinful. But if you are angry, then you won't be sinning anymore. That sounds mad, doesn't it? I'd argue that that's exactly what Paul's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. 
Listen to this. What is our context? Our context in verse 25 is this. We have put away a false representation of Christianity. And we need to speak the truth to our neighbour. Therefore, because of this, be angry and do not sin. So we as Christians are going to have to live the right way, right? So when we see sin, do we embrace it? When we see unrighteousness, do we embrace it? When we see someone in the church who is living in the world for whom the, the death of Christ seems to make no difference, what should our response be? Oh, don't you worry. Oh, well, you know, no big deal. No, we should be angry. And the implication is exactly what I said. The implication is, is that if there's sin in the congregation, and I'm not talking about picking holes in people's lives and judging one another, I'm talking about people living like verse 17 and on. Living like the Gentiles, okay? That's what we're talking about here. All kinds of impurity. Not that I don't think you should have watched that program or I don't think you should have done that. You know, not picking the holes on little things here and there. I'm talking about somebody who is living a life like an unbeliever, right? The right response is to be angry with that. And if we are angry, then we're not sinning. And the implication is, is that if we turn a blind eye to it, and we're not angry about it, if it doesn't make us angry, then we are complicit in that sin. Now the passage makes sense. There is, there is no way that we can be doing that because because and look at look at where he's brought us in this journey in chapter four look at this journey he's brought us on he's brought us on this journey where he's talking about the spirit indwelling us and empowering us and how that affects us corporately if there's somebody in this church who thinks that they can live like the gentiles lived then when we invite someone to church and say, hey, come and hear the gospel. Come and hear good news. Come and meet with God. Come and hear what God has to say. Then if there's somebody who is part of this church who's living that way, then the, the, the whole representation of Christ has been muddied already. We need to be angry about it. We need to not tolerate it. And the urgency of the situation becomes clear in the second half of the verse. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now what most versions don't communicate here is that the second anger here is a different Greek word. It's a different Greek word. And it is a word that was typically used to mean the cause of one's anger. It wasn't so much the external anger as the internal thing that brings about the anger. Right? So if somebody kind of punches you and that makes you angry, then you being angry with that person who punched you is the first word, be angry and do not sin. But then punching you is the cause of your anger. That's what's referred to by the second word for anger here. So what it's saying is this. If there is a situation when you need to be angry about something, don't leave it. Don't deal with it next month, next week, next year. Do not let the sun go down on the cause of the anger. The thing that is going on that has provoked you to anger, and rightly so, don't let the sun go down on it. Now, very, very important context of Ephesians. Who are the ministers of the church? All of you. Everybody. Every one of us is a minister. So it's very important at this point. I think one of the ways in which this passage of scripture is, is, is maligned practically is when people think it is the job of the leadership of the church to solely the leadership of the church to deal with sin. Now, when it comes to things like church discipline and what have you, there is, of course, a, a, a unique role for church leadership. I'm not saying that there isn't. The, the church leadership watch over the sheep. They are shepherds to those sheep. That's absolutely right. But we can't see everything. You know, as a church grows, there become, you know, friendships here and friendships there. And if you see your brother or sister in Christ... 
living an ungodly life, living a life of false representation. And again, I'm not talking about picking holes in people. I'm talking about a general lifestyle. If you see that and you don't say anything or do anything, you're in sin. You're complicit in that sin. And so we do not want to let the sun go down. I don't, some people will, will take that very, very literally and, and say, um, you know, it has to be dealt with that day. Uh, as time goes by, I, I've softened a bit on that. And I, I think probably it's just a, a proverbial expression speaking of urgency. Now, just to back that up and again for a second time to show you that my conclusions here are not in isolation. You may have noticed, some of you in your versions, that this is another quotation from the Old Testament. Some people miss this one actually. In my Bible here, um, I have what's the cross-referencing section where you have a center column that has all the, the cross-references. And for some reason, it's got a reference to Psalm 37, which basically says, don't be angry, when the passage says, do be angry, which is weird. But it's actually a quotation from Psalm 4. So if you want to briefly turn to Psalm 4. The psalmist here is crying out to God. He's probably stressed at night time, struggling to sleep, as we'll see at the end. And he's crying out to God. He says, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. So who is the one from whom our righteousness comes? It's from God. It's God of our righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. So I prayed to you in the past and you've given me relief. So I'm going to come to you again now for prayer. Now he says to the men, this is not to God now. And this is him in his distress. This is the cause of his distress. O oh men, how long shall my honour be turned into shame? In other words, this man for whom godliness and righteousness is important. David's righteousness is an important thing. But the men are turning his honour into shame. How? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? So again, we have a pursuit of falsehood, probably false living again. But we have the pursuit of falsehood by these men who are somehow connected with David and bring shame where he had honour. David's honour is being removed because of the sin of other people. That's the important thing to get in verse 2. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. So there's this distinguishing, like we had in Ephesians 4, 17 and following, this distinguishing between the godly and the ungodly, the lying life and the truthful life. And then he says in verse 4, be angry and do not sin. Who's he telling to be angry? It's the men. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices. There's another link to Zechariah 8 and those concepts of the right sacrifices that God desires. Mercy. Kindness. Rather than fasting days he never asked for in the first place. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. And so what he's saying in that verse, be angry and do not sin. What he's saying there is he's saying to the men who are the ones who are bringing, who are associated with David and bringing shame to David's name, to the house of David, to the kingdom of David. They're bringing shame to him because of their false living. He says, you guys, you need to be sitting down in your room and you need to be thinking on this and you need to be angry and not sin. In other words, in the context of Psalm 4, what he's saying is, you people who are sinning need to be angry with yourselves and with your own sin and what you're doing. Then what Paul does in Ephesians 4 is he takes that concept where you who are sinning and you who are lying with your lives, you need to be angry with yourself and not those around you. Because sometimes when we're angry, we lash out in our anger against God and we sin. Our sin is justified in our hearts by our anger with God, with the situations that he puts us in. 
And you should be angry with yourself. And what Paul does is does a lovely little twist on this. And he takes that concept, which is true, and he's, he's saying here, and he puts it into the context of Ephesians 4 and community. And the spirit being given to all and us all being united. And us all being one body. And he says this. He says, if the person who is sinning should be angry, then the whole of that body should be angry. That's what he's saying. And therefore, you see how Paul in Ephesians 4 um, is not saying anything new by saying that we should be angry. And that by being angry, we are keeping ourselves from sin. What he's doing that is new is he's taking the concept where the individual who sinned should be angry with themselves. And saying, you guys are one body. And therefore, what the hand does affects the leg. What the nose does affects the ear. Because you are all connected in your one body. It was true in a sense in David's day. He was, brought shame by the, uh, he was brought shame by the actions of others. But how much more so is it true in the body of Christ? And that is why we need to be angry about sin and not give an opportunity, uh, and not let the sun go down from the cause of the anger. And then look at verse 27 and give no opportunity to the devil. And again, when people pluck verses out of context, this could just be mean almost anything. But let's look at our context. If we allow sin to be tolerated, and if we allow sin to be celebrated, and if we don't clamp down on sin, if we think it's acceptable somehow, then what we are doing is giving the devil an opportunity. If you say to someone who's in sin, oh, don't worry, that's okay, the devil is getting a foothold in their lives and you've just authorized it in the name of God. You said, I didn't say anything in the name of God. You're a Christian. Everything you do is in the name of God. And so we need to make sure we don't give the devil an opportunity. And I hope that as ministers of the Lord, we will be aware of this and we will know that the devil would love to tear this church apart the devil would love to have sin festering and prospering in our body and we need to be careful not to do that not to allow that to happen and so what does that look like well then in verse 28 he comes to the specifics um, we can be a little quicker here now let the thief no longer steal but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And so, if you're someone who, before you were a Christian, you were a thief, then coming to church is not an opportunity to steal from new people or to take advantage of the kindliness of people who are perhaps naive to your ways, as is often the case, but actually it is an opportunity for you to do things differently and to work and to do honest work. Uh, notice how there how our work should be honest. There's a, some work that we should never do, but... Do honest work with your own hands. And look at, the, look at the reason for work here. The reason for work is not simply that he would no longer steal, but so that he then can help others. You know? Whatever you think, I'll be very careful, promise. Whatever you think about the welfare state and welfare as a concept politically. Okay, I keep politics out of the pulpits. I'm not going there, so don't worry. I'm simply saying this, we as a church have a duty to welfare amongst our own. So regardless of where you stand on the political divide, put that aside, we as a church have a responsibility one to another. But being someone who doesn't want to work isn't the same as being someone who can't work. And so someone who would steal in the past is no longer to do that, to work. And then they can help with someone who's in need. And you've got to remember, this was a time before insurance companies. This was a time. You know, I've been hearing so many reports from down in Louisiana where there were floods um, of the churches coming together and meeting people's needs and feeding them and, and, and helping replace things. And... That, you know, of course it's not publicised, is it? You know, it's not, it, they don't want to give Christianity positive press. But apparently, from all I know from in the area, the church has done an absolutely outstanding job amongst the community. And, you know, 
that that's one thing amongst the community, but our priority is amongst one to another. And it's just uh, it's important that when we labor, we labor to have enough for ourselves, for our family, for our kids and stuff. But also so that when we see someone in need, we have an opportunity to be able to say, I can help. I can I can step in here. Um, Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, when it comes to Christianity and talk that is corrupted, 90% of Christians think about swear words. It's the focus, it's the focus, and we're so obsessed with it. That we even have turned one of the Ten Commandments into a conversation about swearing. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Look, listen, when, when the, the time of the Ten Commandments were, were written, there wasn't, as far as we know, a massive problem amongst the Jewish community that someone would accidentally be chiseling and drop a hammer on their toe and say, Oh, Yahweh. That wasn't what was being addressed. Ironically, what was being addressed is exactly what we're studying this morning. The misrepresentation of God and taking his name in vain and saying, well, God thinks this and God says that. And we do that with our lives as well. Misrepresent God. It's that misrepresentation that is the issue there. So whenever I see references in the epistles to let no corrupting, you know, when it, okay, if you read an article saying, hey Christian, don't swear, then you'll have this as one of the list of verses that are put in that article. No corrupting talk. But look at what it's saying. And by the way, I'm not defending swearing, I'm just simply saying that's not what's being spoken of here. There are some Christians who would never utter a swear word in their life and yet whose tongue can cut people down and crush them in a heartbeat. And I would much rather have people who occasionally slip up and say a word they shouldn't say, but whose tongue is generally used for building up and giving grace, than to have someone who never says an inappropriate word, but is cutting people down. And there is a, this This passage isn't speaking about talk that corrupts people, that affects people, because it's not building up and it doesn't fit the occasion. And notice that fit the occasion. There are times, as we have just seen, when it is appropriate to be angry. So how do we follow that? How do we have this verse about anger and being angry with sin and not tolerating sin in the congregation? And right next to it, we have this thing about no corrupting speak, no corrupting speech and building people up. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion and may give grace to those who hear. When we address sin, we are not simply saying, ah, oh, great, this person's in sin. Now I can finally let rip with my tongue. Now I can finally bash them. What we're trying to do is to take our brother and sister in Christ And build them back up and restore them. Just as Paul says in Galatians, bearing in mind the next time it may well be us. How would we want to be addressed? And how would we want to be lifted up? It doesn't mean that we tolerate sin. It doesn't mean that we neglect to address sin. It's got to be dealt with it. It has to be dealt with swiftly and continually. It's can't, you can't let the sun go down on the thing that has brought righteous anger into you because of the misrepresentation of God. But when we are speaking to people, we don't want words that are going to cut and destroy and corrupt. We want words that are going to build up that will fit the occasion. So sometimes we're going to have to be tough. You know what? That sin, it cannot happen here. You can't just go on like this. This is not acceptable. But we do it in a manner that brings grace. Because God has called you. Because Christ has redeemed you. And because you have in you the Holy Spirit. And that same Spirit can empower you so you don't have to live this life anymore. 
And you don't have to be trapped like that anymore. You can put off that way. You can have your mind renewed and think differently. And you can put on the new man. We can give talk that gives and deals with grace in such occasions. And so it is in this context. Verse 30. Do not grieve the spirit of God. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now I'm going to probably have to wrap up a little bit early and pick up next time. But... This is a verse that I think is taken out of context and, and really can't be because, because it, it is very clear what it means here. The bottom line is this. When we live in a manner that is not worthy of the calling, which is what the whole of this passage has been addressing. When we live in a way that, um, that is a lie, that misrepresents the holiness of God. When we do that, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, grieving of the Holy Spirit is a phrase that has become so well known in Christian society that we lose sight of what it means. Grieving is what you do when someone you love dearly dies. Grieving is weeping. Grieving is mourning. Grieving is sadness. I don't know how it's happened, but I know in many Christian circles, the phrase, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, the word that we associate with that is more anger. And I guess in the context, it is talking about being angry with sin. But as a contrast to that, we're told here that when we live that way, we're going to make God really sad. Mourning sad, wailing sad, weeping sad. And you see how that shift has gone. Their sin, be angry, don't let the sun go down on the cause of the anger, but then when you speak, let your words not be cutting, let they be building up. Because ultimately what you've done here in this sin that we must be angry with is we've saddened God. Don't, don't sadden God. And specifically, you've saddened the third person of the Trinity. Why, when it comes to the saddening of God? I prefer that word. I think it makes it more real, doesn't it? Grieving the Spirit is just, we're so familiar with that term. Why, when we're dealing with the saddening of God, making him mourn? Why is it the third person of the Trinity is the one that Paul refers to? Well, he tells us why. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That refers back to chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14. Where the Spirit of God was given to us. He is the one who empowers us. But he is God's guarantee of the future redemption. The picture that Paul is painting is this. He's painting a picture that says... Here is the Spirit of God given to you, a seal. A seal can't be broken. God will one day redeem you. That's when you'll lose the Spirit. The Spirit will, you won't have the Spirit in you forever because we will dwell with God for eternity as it was once in the beginning. He will be with us and we'll be with Him and like Adam and Eve in the garden, we'll dwell together. So that seal will eventually be opened. Okay? But until that time, he's here in us, stuck, sealed. And every sin, every lie, every time we misrepresent God, the Spirit of God is within us. The one who would empower us to live correctly, the one who would empower us to righteous living is inside of us. And we are ignoring him, we are being deaf to him, we are shutting him out, and we are not listening. And he weeps. That's the picture that Paul creates. You see, we're supposed to be putting on this new nature. The Spirit of God is supposed to be oozing out of us. Giving a fragrant aroma to those around us. And when we shut him in, like he's not there, and live as the Gentiles do, he weeps. That's the picture that Paul is painting here. 
And so he says, verse 31, super quick, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be away from you along with all malice. And rather than take forever and do single word studies, I think the picture that we have there is pretty clear. Isn't it interesting that the, here he says don't be angry when having before he said be angry. But the difference is very clear in context. There is a time in the congregation when we see sin where we need to be angry. But in the context of showing malice towards one another, we mustn't be angry. So if somebody comes along and treads your toe and annoys you and treats you badly, you shouldn't be angry with them. You should be forgiving towards them. But if somebody in some way that doesn't really affect you at all is living in sin, then you should be angry about it. And we have a tendency to do the opposite. Well, why should I, not, why should I be bothered about that person sinning? It makes no difference to my life. And at the same time, well, of course I'm angry. They did that to me. And yet biblically, it's the other way around. They did that to me, but I'm going to forgive them like Christ forgave me. And this person sinning over there, and that is grieving the Holy Spirit, and that is misrepresenting God, and I need to help that person. I'm not happy that that's going on. You see the difference? That's how it, that's how it plays out. And so we don't want to have bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander in us. We want to put that away. We want to put away malice. And in contrast to all of that, we want to be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. You know what? If someone is living in sin, we need to be angry. But we need to have kind words of grace to help restore them. It doesn't mean if they continue in sin, we have to put up with it and deal with it. But it means we want to, with kindness, bring them to repentance. We want to turn them away from sin. But we need to forgive one another. If somebody does sin, if someone in our midst does fall, it shouldn't hang over them like a cloud forevermore. We've got to forgive. Because we're all sinners and we all mess up. And most of the time we do it in secret and we get away with it. And sometimes someone sins more publicly. And I don't want there ever to be a situation in church where, oh, that's the person who did that in 1954 or whatever, you know? You don't want that. You need to forgive one another. Why? Because Christ forgave us. That's the whole basis of our faith. You see, there is an anger that comes from a forgiving heart. Christ has forgiven us and we love the Lord and we don't want to grieve the Spirit of God. And so we're angry about sin in the congregation that would destroy our witness because it's so important. But stuff to us, no, we've got to let go of that. We've got to let go of it. We've got to forgive one another because Christ forgave us. Can you imagine if God had the attitude of forgiveness that we typically have? But he forgave us everything. And finally, and I'll pick up in chapter 5 next time, verse 1 and 2 kind of act as a bridge between the two sections. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering, I love that, and sacrifice to God. So therefore, summary of all that's been happened, therefore we're going to have to imitate God in the way that we live. God gets angry with sin, we're going to imitate that. But we're also going to be kind and forgiving. And God is also slow to anger. Exodus 33 and 34. And so we're going to mirror that as well. We're going to imitate him as children imitate their parents. So we're going to imitate our father in heaven. We're going to walk in a manner that is characterized uh, by love. Because Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And that manner that we walk in will be a fragrant offering and it will be a sacrifice to God. So the way in which we live our lives, we've been putting aside our own desires, putting aside our own wants, wants, what we want to do, what's easier for us, and do what is pleasing to God. So that as we live our lives, that spirit-infused life will radiate out this fragrant offering to God where he will look at our lives and go, that's exactly what I wanted. I pray that it will be so for all of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, and I pray that uh, I pray that that passage would be un understandable to us all now, and I pray that the message would be would be clear to us all as well. Um, Lord, I I thank you for your word, and I thank you that that your word is understandable in context, and I thank you for the harmony between the old and the new. 
But Lord, I thank you that you have made us one body. And it's hard for us. We're in a very individualistic society. We do what we want. We live our lives the way we want to live our lives. And we're, we're taught to be selfish and to do what's good for us and forget about everybody else. But Lord, I pray that we might have a place here where there is humble, sacrificial living. Forgiveness, forgiving one another, being gentle with one another, being graceful to one another, speaking gracefully, building up and not tearing down. Lord, I pray that you would enable us to live that way. Lord, you have enabled us to live that way. You've given us your spirit. May we grow in him, grow in knowledge, grow in understanding, that we might live in a in a way that is a both fragrant offering and a sacrifice to you. May you be glorified in our midst, Lord. Amen.